So, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, the third day of this uh, excellent conference. Uh, we are going uh, to have uh, another very exciting program, and this morning session, uh, we are going to start uh, with Jan Hoymarkes from Netherlands. Yeah, good morning, Jan. Can you hear us? Hello, yes, Jan Hoymarkes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So, uh, Jan, please uh, go ahead and start when you're ready. I am. So, I hope you will see my slides. Is this okay? Do you see my slide? Yes, we can see your slide, Jan. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. So, no disclosures. And before I start, let me say that I am delighted uh, to be invited for this uh, very interesting meeting uh, and a, a very timely meeting. Um, I have no disclosures um, and um, my topic is of course maintaining nature's perfection which goes wrong with, with aging and I would like uh, to uh, highlight the impact of DNA damage and repair and nutrition uh, on sustaining health and particularly focus towards a new process that we have discovered, transcription stress. So uh, I'm coming from the field of DNA damage and repair, and all of us know that uh, DNA can be damaged from outside, UV, radiation, chemicals, endogenously as well. Uh, alkylating agents, reactive oxygen species, even mechanical stress and water damage DNA daily. Uh, up to, we think, maybe 100,000 damages per day. And of course, DNA uh, damage leads to altered metabolism. And one of the consequences are mutations and mutation and chromosomal aberrations lead to cancer. And DNA damage is a main cause of cancer. But another effect of DNA damage is that it will block transcription and may arrest replication in replicating cells. And that leads to a cell cycle delay, a permanent arrest, which can in the end lead to senescence. Transcription may go down, a functional decline occurs and cells may die. And we think this is a main cause of systemic aging. Fortunately, there are constantly repair systems that counteract and that, uh, that try to limit the consequences. But um, I would like to focus on block transcription for today. And that leads to transcription stress and a very important process that, um, that blocks, that, um, that counteracts blocking transcription is transcription coupled repair. I have no time to explain this process. It's now being elucidated, very interesting process, but the consequences of uh, transcription uh, coupled repair defects I will highlight later. So even with normal repair, um, some damages are not detected and some lesions are irreparable. Sometimes repair is there too late or not error-free and repair also may decline with aging. So. Even with potent repair, still DNA damage leads uh, accumulate in time, uh, causing cancer and we think also systemic aging. Uh, and in repair mutants, of course, these effects are accelerated. And one of the processes that I already highlighted was transcription coupled repair. And there are very rare but very severe syndromes where people, children are born with defects in this in this pathway, and one of these uh, disorders is called cocaine syndrome, very rare, no cancer, by the way. Actually, the, oh, they are overprotected from cancer, but show instead very severe neurological development abnormalities and a very short life expectancy, tragically of only 12 years. This is a French patient, Baptiste, at the age of three. You see already some abnormalities, but they are much worse at the age of seven very small, needs glasses, and hearing aids cannot walk, these children cannot speak. Uh, it's a dramatic uh, progressive disease, and Baptiste became only 10. And this is his sister for comparison, one year older. Very dramatic disease, at this moment, no cure. Another one, which is called trichothyodystrophy, is even more puzzling. These children have many elements in common with cocaine, syndrome, but they have on top of that something very peculiar, brittle hair, brittle nails, abnormal skin. Uh, here you see a patient 
Um, and in this case, also another repair process that is more or less complementary, nucleotide excision repair is also deficient. So you see multi-organ accelerated aging, but primarily in the post-mitotic tissues, the neurons, the liver, the kidney, the skeleton, not so much the hematological system, which is much more proliferative. So it's segmental aging and it points to a specific link with transcription because this is linked with transcription coupled repair defects. I'll come back to that later. We made many repair mouse mutants and one of them is this one, ESCC1, the Delta hypermorph mouse, um, which also was uh, discussed yesterday by Laura Niedernhofer in an excellent presentation. And this mouse shows all round progressive aging. It's not segmental. It's, it's everywhere. Everywhere where we look, we see features of accelerated aging. The mouse lives four to six months. But in this case, this mouse happens to have a defect and we think at least four repair systems. And they are critical for all organs. That's why we think we see not segmental, but now multimorbidity over the whole body. And this is what spontaneous DNA damage can apparently do if you cannot properly repair. But remember, even with proper repair, these things happen, but it takes more time. And particularly in this case, this mouse is a, is a very beautiful model for neurodegeneration and we think also for Alzheimer's and Parkinson, and maybe that will come back later. So um, what we also found, this connection between DNA damage and, and all round accelerated aging, that these very short lived repair mutants, and I, I showed you only one, but we have many, they suppress the growth hormone, IGF somatotrophic axis, and they prioritize resilience mechanisms, antioxidant defense, stress resistance above growth. We think in an effort to extend their short lifespan. And the low IGF levels and growth hormone levels explain why these Cochin syndrome children all stay very small and the mice too. And this response, which we have termed survival response, resembles the same as dietary restriction and the long-lived dwarf mutants. So they also delay aging. So uh, what we found is, so these repair deficient accelerated aging mouse models that stay small, already suppress growth, invest in maintenance, but we wondered what would happen when you actually apply calorie restriction to these mice because we gave them food all the time. So uh, this is the survival curve of uh, female mice uh, of the ESCC1 phenotype. The first mouse dies by 12 weeks and the last by 27. So they have a lifespan of four to six months when they have unlimited food. So the other half of the cohort was uh, put on diet from week seven onwards. And then we see a dramatically expanded uh, life, uh, life expectancy. 200% median as well as maximum lifespan is dramatically extended. Uh, and not only lifespan, all features of aging that we have uh, investigated unequivocally show delayed aging, but particularly the neuronal system. And that's what I would like to show on two movies. So these are litter made mutant mice. This mouse had food all the time, 16 weeks old, neurologically already so much compromised, it cannot normally walk. It shows these tremors. It cannot control muscles. It has contractions and it has even imbalance problems, whereas the other mouse, the mouse next door, little mate, put on a diet from week seven. You see, it cannot, it cannot keep even balance. When that, whether the other mouse is put um, um, uh, on a diet and walks around like uh, normal, uh, if you put these two mice on a rotating rod, compared with a wild type mouse on diet, and this fat mouse is a wild type at libitum food, I'll start the movie. The mouse that couldn't walk on the previous movie drops down immediately already. And after three minutes, the fat mouse has dropped. And now in this movie, the wild type drops before the mutant does. So um, there is a tremendous difference simply by 30% dietary restriction between the, the mutant on a diet and the mutant at libitum. So if this calorie restriction mechanism um, works better than any medication would be expected to achieve, at least in the mouse. If it would apply to children with cocaine, then instead of 12, they might become 36 and would be in a much better shape. Uh, of course, <laughs> mice are not humans, and particularly these children, cocaine and TTD, are fragile. They are tiny. They get extra food because they don't grow. So now I show you Emma, the first TTD uh, patient um, that uh, we 
tried to see what happens with, with, with calorie restriction. She's six years old, cannot walk, cannot talk, cannot read, cannot write. Uh, that is not uh, possible for these children. Um, and uh, she receives every day 1150 kilocalories directly in the stomach because these children also have hardly any appetite. I'll move you. I hope it works. And I hope you can hear. So she can barely crawl. She shows these tremors, these, these uncontrolled muscle, muscle movements and brittle hair, by the way. So uh, this is what she maximally can do. A little bit of crawling. Then uh, in 18, 2018, she uh, tremors uh, over her whole body. This is what happens in a mice too. She shakes and you can try to stop it, but it doesn't work because the muscles cannot be controlled by their neurons. And she could not put two duplo blocks on top of each other. And this is a very bad sign. In the mice, they later get paralyzed and then they die. So um, then uh, in... Um, 28th of May 2018, we, st we started to be together with the doctor to reduce calorie intake in steps of 100 from 1150 to 850. And within 12 days, she could build with Duplo again. So tremors were gone. And then a few months later, I got this movie. So she started to be able to walk independently. And then same time, she started to speak and count. That is something that she was not able to do at all before. She could not pronounce words. And she can now do a head over heel. She started in January to start writing her name. And, she, and they didn't need diapers anymore. She can build delicate constructions. And then she starts bicycling. Her health is stable for over three years. Now she got a vaccination for COVID. So Emma has dramatically improved. Um, upon reduction of calories from 1150 to 850, she regained appetite. Now she still gets extra food, so it's not at all starved. 200 kilocalories, but in two weeks she lost the tremors. She does miraculously well. She is more interactive, eager to learn, in a good mood, enjoys stable health. Despite a lower calorie intake, she still grows in length. She can walk, understand, speak, count, verbally respond, and write, starts writing her name instead of worse or stabilized. Her condition very much improved. And now very uh, in a recent uh, Amy and Friends family and science meeting and clinicians meetings, um, the nutritional guidelines for these children have been reversed. Instead of more, these children should obtain less food. So how does it work? And how can it improve? So dietary restriction redesigns metabolism. Uh, it boosts protection systems. Uh, yesterday, fasting, um, Tom Rando showed uh, also increased resilience in, in, in muscle stem cells. And we think, uh, we have shown actually that dietary restriction leads to a reduced DNA damage load genome-wide. And that leads to a less transcription stress and thereby improved cell function that slows down uh, aging and can actually in neurons improve functionality. So what is transcription stress? So we noted that mutants in transcription coupled repair, they show premature aging in the neuronal system, the liver, the kidney, post-metodic tissues that do not dilute DNA damage by replication. So damage there only accumulates. And DNA damage, of course, interferes with transcription too. So we wondered what happens to transcription in our progeria with mutants. Uh, and so we developed a method for in vivo nascent RNA um, uh, synthesis measurements by a U incorporation, click chemistry, organic, uh, uh, organic typic slices. This is a wild type liver at different age. Uh, EU incorporation is over here. You see there is robust RNA synthesis uh, in young um, normal mice. Now ESCC1, uh, the same age. You see already at four weeks, more so at 16, and even more at 20 weeks, there is a drop, an overall drop in RNA synthesis. So the, the RNA synthesis output declines. In, um, in aging, in these rapidly aging animals. But is this specific for our transcription coupled repair mutants? Of course, they have a repair defect. So now we looked into normal, natural aging. 
And there too, this is 16 and this is 100 weeks, you see there is a drop in RNA synthesis overall in the liver of natural aging. Uh, so indeed, this is um, a general phenomenon that we first found in our repair deficient mice that show bona fide accelerated aging. Is this due to the fact that maybe RNA polymerase is downregulated with aging? So we looked in the, in, in the same uh, tissues for RNA synthesis so, uh, and also RNA polymerase. So this is RNA synthesis, 10 weeks young, and this is all two year old. You see this drop that I showed you before on the previous slide. Now, the same, uh, the same uh, liver sample analyzed for total RNA polymerase too at young and old age. Now, instead of lower, there is more RNA polymerase in old. And this is in elongation mode, because if you take, uh, if, you've, if you test for, uh, for serine 2 phosphorylation, which is elongating RNA polymerase, there is more RNA polymerase in elongation. And in initiation, there is no difference. So there is something wrong with elongation and transcription, the transcription goes down, but elongating RNA polymerases are increased in aging wild type livers. So we wanted to know what's going on. So we developed next gen sequencing of nascent RNA synthesis in living mice, in liver. Uh, and this is developed by Akos Dienis uh, and Joris Potthoff and uh, Chang, uh, I will show you later some other data. So we did um, now genome-wide analysis, 4,000 genes, and we divided every gene in 20 bins and then analyzed um, how what happens with transcription in all these different parts of the gene from the, uh, uh, from the uh, three, five prime end to the three prime end. So um, in adult normal uh, wild type liver, you see a decline when you go over the genome because uh, this uh, RNA from the beginning is present in every growing RNA. And the further you go, uh, the lower the uh, last parts are. So this is the normal um, growing tree of R. And this shows actually that we are measuring nascent RNA synthesis. Now, if you compare that to an adult, from an, to an old, then you see there is a stronger decline in old. So, and this is... So this is genome-wide and highly significant. You can see it's, it's very significant. Uh, and if you now look for the, the same RNA, the same tissue, if you look for the presence of RNA polymerases of the genes, so the further you go in the gene, the more RNA polymerases. This is the increase in adult, wild-type, normal liver, and this is the increase in old. So there is not less, but there is even more RNA polymerases. And uh, not only total RNA, if we take uh, serine uh, 2, then we see also the same increase. So aged liver shows a decline in nascent RNA production over all genome but gene bodies, so genome-wide, while elongating polymerases uh, are more increasing. So our sequencing uh, matches the uh, immunofluorescence, and it implies there is a lower RNA productivity of RNA polymerases with aging. So you can show it also genome-wide in a three-bin analysis. So now all genes are divided in three equal parts. And here we have sorted 4,000 genes, uh, the ones which have the strongest decline over the gene body on top and the ones with the least decline uh, to the bottom. And you see blue means less. So uh, there is over the, from the first to the middle bin to the last bin, there is overall a decline over all genes. Even genes that are up in the beginning go down in, uh, in aging. If we now look in the same uh, tissue for RNA polymerases, it's the opposite. And actually the genes with the, the, the strongest decline shows the, show the most increased in presence of total RNA polymerase. So nearly every gene that is expressed shows a decline in nascent RNA, which declines from three prime towards, towards the three prime end. So it's genome wide and it appears proportional uh, to the RNA polymerase to increase. This is not only the mouse liver. If we now look in public uh, aging RNA data sets, which have sufficient intron reads and have a first to last exon um, uh, uh, proportional um, uh, presence, then in human tendons, we see the same. And in uh, also, uh, this is the liver, and in even C. elegans, there is a more pronounced decline over the genome. 
So this aging-related transcriptional decline appears conserved uh, in, in distant species. Um, and uh, when this is due to stochastic damage, you can make a very strong prediction, namely that a small gene has less chance to have a lower um, suppression than uh, a long gene. And that is indeed what we found, uh, not only in, uh, in uh, our ESCC1 mice, when, they, when in the liver, when we look for the up genes at libidum food, they are generally shorter than down genes. The down genes are much longer. And dietary restriction, calorie restriction, shows, uh, uh, compensates for this uh, effect. So, and it is not only uh, in the liver, in the hippocampus of a mouse, ESCC1 mouse, if you compare all to young, the up genes are much smaller than the down genes. And the same is true for human hippocampus. The, in, when you compare all to, to young, the up genes are much smaller on average than the down genes. So there is, um, and this we find also in human Alzheimer uh, samples, and other people have, uh, by coincidence, also observed this. So um, we can demonstrate that this is DNA damage because the damage strand when RNA polymerase is blocked by a damage cannot be amplified. Uh, and, um, and that is what we see if you do that for um, our samples. So with aging, we can see that on average, there is a strand bias, the non-transcribed strand, which is not damaged, amplifies better than the transcribed strand. That means there is something blocking the transcribed strand uh, by, um, uh, for the amplification step. And this is particularly uh, true for a uh, total RNA polymerase as well as the elongating RNA polymerase. And short genes have much less of a problem than long genes. So uh, this is the model. We think that with aging, our genome gets clogged by damage because the transcription coupled repair system cannot cope with all the damage that blocks to long genes being uh, suppressed in uh, expression that leads to an imbalanced RNA pool. And this imbalanced RNA pool can explain large quantities of uh, the total aging expression profiles in uh, tissues that show uh, have hardly any division, so post-metodic tissues. Proteostasis, nutrient sensing, energy metabolism, cytoprotection, stress response, immune system, they all largely can be explained by a transcription stress profile. And I'll show you one gene too close, the IGF-1 gene, which is very critical for uh, lifespan determination. So uh, if you compare the nascent RNA synthesis in a wild-type young liver, in green and compare it to the wild type liver for old. Even in old, there is more promoter bound RNA polymerases. But because of the transcriptional stress, in the end, you end up with less. So this explains why with aging, IGF goes down. And IGF down means upregulation of the survival response, which resembles dietary restriction driven by DNA damage that accumulates in time. So we think this explains why the somatic, somatotrophic axis goes down with aging, because the IGF gene happens to be a very long gene, 85 kilobase, where it encodes only a 70 amino acid protein. So uh, Aging is associated with DNA damage driven chain length dependent transcriptional decline, mainly in postmectotic tissues, neurons, liver, kidney, because they cannot dilute damage accumulation by DNA replication. This preferentially affects long genes, leading to a disbalanced gene expression, and dietary restriction reduces DNA damage load, alleviates transcription stress, reduces transcription expression bias, particularly in neurons, and may improve cell function. And this will be explained. In a, present, in, a, in, a, in a presentation later today in the afternoon by Maria Birkisdotter uh, from our lab uh, in, um, in, in, in Utrecht. Uh, this is the uh, main take home message. These are many people that are involved uh, on slides that were named, but I'm very much indebted to uh, these four people, uh, Wilbert Vermeer, Joris Potthoff, Akos Giannis, and uh, Jiang Xiang, and also Joris Demers, which contributed it. We have all already, uh, we have many collaborations and funding agencies, and I'm very grateful for this patience. Thank you for your attention, and I probably went over time again. I can't hear you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, yeah, a bit over time, but I think we have uh, time for one question. And we have one, actually one here on site. Um, hey, Jan, it's Lennart. Um, it's a great talk, really great story. Um, I had one question. You know, there's um, increasing evidence that dietary restriction does not work in aging. And um, did you look at that um, with this um, system of um, transcription stalling and DNA damage in your system? Yes, very good point, uh, Leonard. And uh, what, I, um, what I didn't have time to show is we have done also dietary restriction intervals. So young um, uh, ESCC1 animals, middle-aged and old. And what happens with old is um, old uh, animals are less stress resistant. So dietary restriction causes stress. So a number of animals die when they are old from the stress. But the ones that do not die, they benefit equally well from dietary restriction than the ones that are adult. So the delay of aging occurs on top of, a, uh, of an enhanced stress sensitivity. So these two mechanisms play a role with aging. Stress resistance becomes less, but the benefit of dietary restriction, if you can cope with the stress, that benefit is the same. And we think so the same mechanism applies at a young age, at, old, at, 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 at adult age, and at all. Thank you very much, Jan. So let's uh, give Jan. Thank you.